It's always with great humility that I stand in front of you here. There's a lot of talent in this room. And on your shoulders, I've learned a lot. So this is the ninth High Performance Design Meets Boots on the Ground. It's a boots on the ground. Right. Thanks, Rob. I'm really happy to be here, and I was honored to be invited to speak. So um, the topic of my talk tonight kind of stems from the uh, Passive Buildings Canada email chain, which uh, many of the pe many people in this room are on. If you're not, you really should be, because there's a lot of great information exchange there. So Rob actually posed a question back in January about sizing air source heat pumps without relying on backup heat in southern Ontario, how to do it, and can we do this and still distribute it to the rest of the house effectively? So. I'm going to propose a system here where we're talking about sizing an air source heat pump in our climate, southern Ontario, without relying on backup heat. And I, I italicize relying because we could provide emergency heat, perhaps, but we're not going to design a system where we rely on the heat to uh, achieve uh, the, to, to heat the building at the heating load. And talk about distributing that throughout the whole house. So, you know, we've done point source projects. I know many of the people in the room probably have. I mean, from a strictly code uh, compliant perspective, we need to be delivering heating to all the spaces in the house. So, not that we don't like to push the envelope as much as everyone else, but I'm going to talk about a system where we're deliberately ducting the heat to all the spaces in the house. And we need to look at doing this all while ensuring that humidity is controlled in the summertime. So, how we do this, one possible solution that I'm, I'm proposing is a cold climate air source heat pump that's sized to handle the entire heating load of the building on the design day. And also, uh, can operate beyond the design day uh, at lower temperatures uh, and it also it's critical we've got inverter compressors to be able to slow the speed down and vary the amount of refrigerant to the indoor system when we're at part load conditions and uh, as I said ducted units so that we can deliver it to uh, bedrooms for instance and then we can still use wall packs for open spaces perhaps and then if we've done all that and we discover we still have a problem with humidity then we might need to consider adding supplemental dehumidification so very briefly, why heat pumps in the first place? They prepare us for an all-electric future. And in Ontario, this is um, Energy Star's latest numbers, uh, 177 grams per kilowatt hour for natural gas uh, versus 40 for, uh, for electricity. So it's a four and a half to one factor. And another argument, uh, I owe Robert Bean credit for this. He opened my eyes to the idea of exergy, which is the useful work potential of an energy. So, to give you an example of what I mean by that, natural gas burns at almost 2,000 degrees Celsius, and we're using that to heat our homes to 20 or 22. It just doesn't make sense from an energy standpoint. So we might be burning the gas in an energy efficient way in a high efficiency boiler or furnace, but we're destroying its energy. So that fuel could have been used for a higher temperature industrial process. And given that it's a non-renewable resource, in essence, every time we're doing that, burning it to heat our homes, we're denying future generations the ability to use that high energy fuel to do things like make steel, for instance. So, um, some challenges with heat pumps, obviously, site versus source factors come into play here. This is Energy Star's latest numbers from February 2018. Canada-wide, we're at 1.96 for electricity, 1.01 for natural gas. But, you know, if you know that over the course of a heating season, if we have a COP that doesn't really go below two, we're still kind of coming out ahead. And I would note that if we have on-site generation, that kind of comes off the top anyway. And obviously, a uh, challenge with heating with electricity versus gas is, um, this is for a typical Cambridge home, recent bills, the cost is about uh, five to one per unit of energy. So it's hard to ignore. So what about uh, climate change and sizing for future considerations? When ASHRAE updated its data in 2009, looking back at world, uh, worldwide weather stations that they're monitoring, they found an overall increase of a degree and a half from the heating degree, or the heating design temperature, which means heating loads are actually decreasing, it's becoming less severe, while at the same time, Cooling uh, design loads have gone up by 0.8 degrees. So uh, the importance of cooling is, uh, is increasing, which is great when you've got a system that can do both, obviously. So getting back to the subject now, how are loads determined? It might seem like splitting hairs to focus on the design temperature, but it, with a technology like air source heat pumps where the performance and the capacity fall off as the temperature drops, it's worth considering what are we actually required to provide by code. So we're talking residential projects here. And part nine is explicit that we need to use the, we need to size the systems for the 2.5% design temperature, which for Ontario is minus 18. And I'm not suggesting we don't ever design below that. In fact, most of us do. But on paper, that's the minimum while maintaining 22 inside. So what does that look like? 
This is the 2.5% design temperature of southern Ontario. You can see there's kind of an imaginary line that runs across Highway 9. And everything below that, uh, the design temperature at two point, the 2.5 percent frequency is um, warmer than minus 20, and then the temperature sort of tails off as we go further north. So, it kind of illustrates the importance of taking the site context into consideration. Designing a system in Bancroft or Ottawa is going to be different than designing it in Windsor, for instance. So. Um, this is what the COP does of a typical air source heat pump. This is just one that I picked uh, to illustrate a point that at, uh, at minus 25, and I don't know how clearly that the bin hours are showing up here, but at the end we're at minus 25, we're at a COP of about one and a half. It climbs to about two around the minus 10 mark and it only gets better from there. So I'll fade that into the background, but keep it in mind, oh, it's gone entirely. Um, <laughs> anyway, hopefully, you can, you can imagine as we overlay that with uh, bin data for Toronto. This is um, Environment Canada recorded temperatures for Toronto from December 1st through March 15th of this year. So recent memory, obviously. And how do we do? Uh, Toronto spent the majority of its year this year in the plus 10 down to minus 5 range, really, in that time frame. And we had that cold snap in January, everybody remembers. But we really weren't down in the minus 15 to minus 20, minus 20 range for very long. Now. Anecdotally, I remember 2014, 2015 as being a particularly brutal year because we just finished a project that relied on an air source heat pump. And uh, that's what this year looked like. We spent a couple hundred more hours down in the minus 10 to minus 15 range, some more hours in minus 15 to minus 20 in Toronto. So what I'm trying to illustrate with this is that the concerns people typically have with air source heat pumps are they're going to shut off at some point and the performance is going to be so poor in really cold temperatures that it doesn't seem worthwhile. But in fact, we spend the majority of the time in the range where this thing, where these work at a COP of two and a quarter or better. And the risk associated with being in the lower end is really, I mean, not that it's not important, but it's not that frequent that it really, that we spend time down there. But conversely, this is Ottawa this year. They spent a couple hundred more hours down in the minus 20 to 25 range than we did here in Toronto. So again, it's very site specific. So every home has a, uh, a load line. Uh, so if we plot how much heat the, the house demands against outdoor air temperature, so we've got kilowatt demand on the left axis, uh, outdoor air temperature on the right axis, on the on the uh, x axis, um, it's going to be close to a linear relationship. I've shown it that way for simplicity here. So you can imagine as the temperature drops, the heating demand to keep the space comfortable increases. Now, an air source heat pump, on the other hand, loses capacity as the temperature drops. This one is, I think, a Mitsubishi Zuba, rated to 100% capacity down to minus 15, and then it tails off a little bit. So, at some point, the heat pump output is going to exactly equal how much heat the house demands, and that's called the heat pump balance point. And anytime the temperature drops below that, the heat's going to demand more heat, or the house will demand more heat than, than the heat can produce, and that's, called, that's where we need supplemental heat to keep the space comfortable. So if we want to design these systems, uh, as I'm proposing, that we can do it with, without electric backup or gas backup, um, just that the heat pump can handle the load, then that, what we need to do is push that balance point down uh, below the design temperature. So there's a couple ways to do that. You could raise the blue line by sizing a bigger system, which is going to use more energy. Or the smart thing to do is, like your project, increase uh, the energy efficiency of the building and flatten the load line. So we can, we can force the, uh, the balance point out further, and then we can look at sizing a smaller heat pump to still meet the load. So when we get down to like passive house level performance, again, now at this point, we wouldn't be considering this heat pump at all. We're looking at a much smaller system and still able to meet the full heating load as long as we design carefully with the, balance, with the uh, outdoor design temperature in mind. So in what I'm proposing where we're not looking at gas backup as an option, it's a fairly straightforward exercise because we're sizing the heat pump to handle 100% of the load because it's always going to be more efficient than the electric, according at least to that COP curve I showed you where it got down to uh, 1.5, it's still 50% more efficient than electric resistance heat, so why would you do anything else? But, I mean, so many clients are still motivated by cost, so if gas is back on the table, the exercise becomes a little bit more complicated. You've got to look at likely what's the lowest operating cost. So you could draw a similar curve where you're plotting operating cost against outdoor air temperature and you'd come up with a different point at which it made sense to switch over. You could do the same thing with site versus source energy, but again, these aren't considerations if we're trying to do all the heating with a heat pump. It's, it's a much more straightforward process. So once we've done that and sized it, the next question has to be, okay, we can handle all the heating load, but how is this going to operate in cooling mode? Can it modulate low enough to control humidity uh, properly? So um, latent loads in space is obviously the main loads are infiltration, ventilation, and people. And if we have a cooling load in a space, uh, it's made up of sensible and latent heat. 
So the sensible heat ratio is the ratio of the sensible heat to the total heating or cooling load in the space. And um, I mention this because most air conditioning equipment has a fairly fixed sensible heat ratio that it can handle as well in the kind of 70 to 80 percent range. So as we do things that reduce the solar heat gain on the building, overhangs, low solar heat gain glass and so forth, we're tackling the, so the sensible heat side, but those other things don't really change. So now we could have an imbalance between what the equipment is capable of doing and what we're asking it to do to keep the space conditioned properly. So it's not just sizing that we have to look at, but it's also the solar heat, uh, sensible heat ratio. So what happens when sensible heat ratio doesn't match up to building loads? This is a CanMed energy study uh, where they used two identical instrumented houses in Ottawa. They were built to R2000. One was set up with a conventional furnace, the other with an air source heat pump. But I'm not showing you this to illustrate the difference between the two technologies. I'm just showing you this to illustrate what happens when we have a mismatch between sizing or application, perhaps how it's controlled, whatever the case is. We end up spending the majority of the cooling season down in the cold and clammy region. So likely, I think what happened here, it's controlling based on the thermostat and the dry bulb temperature. It'll continue to drive the temperature down until it's satisfied and shut off without any regard for what the humidity is doing. And if you're controlling on humidity, the opposite would happen. It would drive down until it's dry enough, but you should be end up overcooling the space. So again, I'm not beating up on the heat pump here. I'm just saying this is what can happen if we're not careful about sizing for cooling as well. Again, this idea, even on Entercan's website now, it still says sizing a heat pump for, for heating is likely to result in oversizing and cooling. And I would say that that's not necessarily true. We, um, you know, inverter compressors help a lot. We're not talking about single speed compressors anymore that are slamming on and turning off all the time. We're talking about the ability to modulate down to meet building load and, uh, and achieving longer run times that we need to, uh, for dehumidification. But I would also add, so that's the sizing part of it, partly figured out. We need to still take a close look at the equipment to see if it matches up. But also, in low sensible heat ratio buildings, we might need to look at adding uh, supplemental dehumidification to bring the uh, sensible and latent loads back in line with what the equipment's able to do. So that could be either coupled to the ERB air, driving, delivering dry air to the spaces, or it could be standalone. And uh, I guess my point is just that we need to look at annual conditions and not just size cooling equipment purely based on peak loading. We should be looking at when are, under what conditions are we going to have a problem and how frequently is that likely to be a problem. So I'm going to leave with one last point, which is uh, neep.org, or one last resource, I should say. If you're not already aware of this website, uh, Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, um, they have a database of uh, cold climate air source heat pumps. Uh, manufacturers submit their data, and they have to meet these three criteria. Energy Star certified, COP of at least 1.75 at minus 15, HSPF of 10. So I would suggest that if we're designing a heat pump in Ontario that uh, is going to do all of the loading, it should probably, this, this list is a good place to start to at least find some that qualify.